time to play the game. Time to play the game! Now went off to uh, uh, join another company. You guys can read about it in the press. That's not what this is about. This is more about CNC. So um, let me move right on. History of CNC. First of all, any history of CNC, any proper history of any RTS genre, at least what we look at as RTS genres, owes a lot <coughs> to. It was the first real-time strategy, at least what we call real-time strategy games. Now there, there certainly were, with a nod to uh, Dan Button and uh, others, games that were strategy games that were real-time. So this is the first time you had a game that looks like what we call RTS. Uh, the point and click, the contextual interface, the, uh, the harvesting, the building, and the fighting, and of course the cinematic presentation. That was actually what, kind of the funny part. This is what Dune 2 looked like. Um, I remember yeah! I remember it looked a lot. Better. <laughs> I'll tell you, man, those pixels were awesome when they came out. And uh, it really was. I mean, we were so excited by this game. Um, and a couple of things about it. First of all, uh, you know, really it was Joe Bostic's passion to make this strategy game. Uh, and it started out with all sorts of ideas and uh, what, what was it going to be about. We had done this, played this game called Military Madness on the NEC Turbo Graphics, which probably nobody even knows about now, but great game. Uh, and he said, this would have been a great game, but I hated the fact that I had to wait for the turn, so why don't we make it real time like we did with I Have the Beholder and some other games. And that was kind of the genesis of uh, Dune 2. So people have pointed to a lot of other games like Urzox Vi and others, but that's not actually where it came from. It came from a game called Military Madness and another game that Brett was playing at the time called Rescue Raiders on the Apple II. And those two games combined is what became Dune 2. And the reason it was Dune 2, does anybody here know why it's called Dune 2? Whatever happened to Dune 1, right? <laughs> so, uh, so the backstory, I don't work for EA anymore, so they can't fire me. <laughs> the backstory of this is we were working for Virgin at the time, and, um, and uh, we had, they said, well, we've got this great property, Herbert's books Dune, was one of Brett's favorites. I said, wow, that's going to be great. I can't wait to do a lot of art direction on that. And that's actually what I contributed to Dune 2 more than anything was art direction. So I'm really proud of these pixels. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> uh, and uh, we sat down and we said, wow, we can make this really great game about this combat. And we can have this spice melange. And that'll be the resource that everybody's fighting over. And it's going to be fantastic. So we get the game all the way done. We, pre we, we preview it to a bunch of people like you, fans. Of course, they didn't know about the game. They went completely crazy about it. They said, this is amazing. It was called Dune. And originally, it was called Dune the Battle for Arrakis, which is what it was called on the Genesis, but that was the original PC release. We were all excited, and it's about now three months before we launched the game. We've got the artwork done, we've got all the intros done, and they go, oh, hang on a tick. Uh, there's this problem, because Virgin had a, a European group doing this game, which is an adventure game called Dune, called the Herbert books, and they're going to be out next month. So you can't call it Dune. <gasps> it's not the game Dune 2. So they actually have nothing at all to do with each other. It was just too late for us to change everything. So the only thing we could do quickly was to add the two at the end. And that's why it's wow. <laughs> So if anybody ever asked you, now you know the real poop, that's why it's Dune 2. Uh, let's see. Um, moving on a little bit from Dune 2, uh, one of the things we liked about Dune 2 was the original forecast for Dune 2. Virgin was like, you know, that strategy stuff, you'll probably hear this again and again, I've heard it for de decades plus. No, that strategy genre, probably going away, it's just too complicated, people don't really like it, real time, feels really hard, you'll probably sell 20,000 copies. Right? So that was the original forecast for Dune 2. Um, and back then, if you sold 100,000 copies, you were doing really, really well. And Dune 2 sold 300,000 copies in about a month and a half, and then everybody stole it. So after that, you couldn't sell anymore because the pirates were crazy and they were sending it to each other, emailing it, or actually um, uh, FTPing it to each other at the time. And basically, it was gone. So we knew that it would have sold a lot more units if we could have done anything about the pirates. Piracy was absolutely rampant. It's, it shipped on one 1.4 megabyte uh, CD or uh, floppy disk. Uh, that's right, guys. 1.4 megabytes was the entire game of Dune 2. And so it actually included all the video, too. We had video on it, right? <laughs> uh, the other thing I contributed to Dune 2 as a programmer, I wrote the video compression codec for Dune 2, which also was added for Command and Conquer. So here's a couple of different things about Command and Conquer. People have asked me many times why Command and Conquer, the original game, was such 
such a moment in gaming history. Why so important? Why do people get so crazy about it? So, of course, the gameplay was great. We worked, um, you know, we had a three-year, well, actually, about, about a two-year development cycle, which turned into a three-year development cycle. Um, and we had uh, three trade shows we showed it at. And so each time we showed the game, people would tell us a lot about it. We tried to make it better. But it was very one-on-one. -on -one. We didn't have uh, online communities to go to like you guys. So it was really uh, in-your-face kind of working with people to make the game better. But my feeling was really that um, one of the things that made CNC so great was the fact that we had this new medium, which was CD-ROM. And so on Dune 2, we could only afford to have a couple of little movies at the beginning of each house or each chapter house because there just wasn't enough space on that CD. We would have to, or the floppy disk, we would have to sell many, many floppy disks to have anything that was meaningful. So the CD-ROM gave us 550 megabytes, and this felt like an ocean. It was too much information. How could we possibly fill 550 megabytes of data? And so um, my little story for this one is, I, I don't know if any of you guys know Brett. He doesn't like to do presentations as much, so he doesn't do as many of these things. But uh, Brett's a kind of uncompromising individual. Uh, love him to death and a good friend forever. So he comes to me and he goes, what we need, Lou, you made that compression algorithm for Dune. What we need is full screen video like television with audio. And the CD's big enough. We can do this. And I go, it's 44 kilohertz. Right, right? I mean, it's, it's not, uh, it, it, this is not a fast device. This is a, nowadays you have 2 times, 16 times, 32 times, 24, all these really fast CD-ROMs. The original CNC was a single speed CD-ROM, 44 kilohertz of data. Anybody here a programmer? Some of you guys? A few of you? Well, only a couple. Well, let me tell you, it's impossible. It cannot be done. So Brett said, you're just being lazy. Go figure it out. <laughs> so, so we went out, we got MPEG, couldn't do it. We went and got Blink. Couldn't do it. Every video thing, wavy, the stuff the guys with seven guests were using, nothing. <laughs> nothing could give you full screen video, so we had to invent it. So we literally wrote our own compression algorithm to do the CD-ROM, which is why you didn't see very many games at the beginning that had full screen video, because most of them could never run on a single speed CD-ROM. And I don't think, frankly, I don't think anybody ever did. Uh, Wing Commander did like an interlace mode, which looked pretty ass. But nobody did <laughs> full screen video except CD-ROM. And that's actually, I'm proud of that as a programmer, because uh, um, you know, if I had known anything better, I would have known not to try. So at least I didn't know better, so I tried. Um, the proof and play mechanic from Dune 2, obviously that was really important to us. We knew the game was going to be great. Um, interesting backstory again. This, this game originally, Command and Conquer, was going to be swords and sorcery. After Dune 2, we really liked the, the fantasy genre, and we said, wow, we're going to do this game about swords and sorcery. It's going to be like Dune 2, but instead of having tanks and stuff, we're going to have you know, people on horses and chargers and all this. We'll have spells and wizards. And, and we had this great idea for this game. It was going to be all about you know, having like these goblins fighting against these knights, and it feels familiar. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we were starting that game out, and we started pitching it to uh, Virgin and others, and they go, yeah, you know, fantasy? We don't think so. Probably not going to work, but it's probably a big favor to us because Brett and Edie and uh, Joe and a bunch of people got, went back to the drawing board and said, okay, we need an original story. We need something that's contemporary. Contemporary is not that fun, so we'll make something that's just a little bit into the future. Something I learned about making games, it's the best place to set a game is something that's just at the edge of our imagination. Because we can imagine that our, our great global uh, societies have these wonderful toys, these wonderful military toys, because we know they're out there and we know they lie. And so we know sooner or later they're going to come out with something cool. And um, it turned from a sword and sorcery game into a military game. And then when it went to a military game, we looked at the modern setting and uh, decided that, and this was Brett, I swear, Brett, brilliant. In, this is 1993. Brett says, you know, what the problem is is we have these two nations, and we have the, we have the I think at first we had the Chinese against the Americans, what we were going to do. And he goes, because the problem is, is that the Chinese really aren't our, our enemy. We have the Cold War with the Russians, not really sure what to do with that. We'll talk about that in a minute. But, but it doesn't really feel right. It doesn't feel good to have this conflict because there's no fight. So how are we going to do this? He goes, really, the war of the future is going to be about a charismatic leader that unites a bunch of people that are feeling downtrodden and unites them into an army that's a widespread terrorist army that they're going to feel like they're doing God's work and the rest of the world is going to be horrified. And it's going to really be about the establishment, the military establishment, societies we know at Western society against terrorism. Really, 1993. Long time ago, guys. And that was the birth of Cain, that was the birth of Nod. Um, I think a lot of the uh, religious uh, references comes from uh, the, the fact that the people making the story were incredibly well read. So they went back to the Quran, back to a lot of religious texts, and they put a lot of layering into this story to build up the Cain character.